Joseph Smith put out to the people that he's just dictating God's words or that he's dictating the words on the stone. Privately, he has a different definition of revelation that is more liberal, more uh, nuanced than what he let out. So I'm back with Dan Vogel, who I consider to be uh, the greatest living historian on early Mormonism, if not one of the greatest. I, I, I don't think it's, it's exaggeration to say you're the greatest living historian on uh, early Mormonism. And, and that's uh, for this reason, Dan. Uh, and the way I look at it is in scholarship and academia, there's consumers and producers. And uh, most people, I think, who write on early Mormonism, I could be wrong, I think they are consumers of, of the documents. And you're actually a producer of the documents. Uh, not in the sense of of that Forger Hoffman, but in the sense of you go and you hunt them down and you yeah. edit them mm -hmm. and then publish them so that now I don't have to go and look in some uh, you know newspaper from 1830 that I if I lucky I, today I can find it online, but back then you know good luck. Um, you actually have now made it available, so now I can yeah. I can find out okay what are the sources. Now somebody could argue that you didn't do a correct job of. Um, you know, they could always argue that. And I'm sure you would say there's mistakes you made. Um, uh, you know, everybody has that. Um, yeah. But you've made these sources available and then your conclusions are based on the sources rather than going to dig up sources to back up, you know, what you want to argue or what you believe or something, which is what, frankly, some people do in every field, let's be honest. Um, so, all right. So we talked about the first vision. And before we go on, I want I want to, bring up this and I want to get your thoughts on it. So I, I am now convinced after the research I've done, which I admit is relatively uh, limited in scope, um, mainly preparing for this interview. Uh, I did a whole, I've been doing research for the past year. Actually, first I did the research and I'm like, okay, I got to talk to this guy. <laughs> this, yeah. this is this is the guy I got to talk to. Yeah. Uh, and hopefully I'll do an interview with Royal Skousen one day because he's another guy I'm really fascinated in his work. Um, so so I'm convinced that everybody in Old Testament and New Testament studies and probably Islamic studies, but I don't know enough about that, should be forced to take a class on early Mormonism and study it because there are things that we can learn from early Mormonism that we can only, that, that we can apply to these other fields. And I'll give you an example and I want your thoughts on it. So there's a big, not even a debate, there's a big discussion um, about Paul and in the New Testament, which letters he wrote. Yeah. And uh, they'll say, well, Paul wrote this letter, but that letter is either a forgery or it was written by one of his disciples, depending on your perspective. And the reason is he uses the same terminology as Paul, but in a completely different way. And so that's not Paul's terminology. That's, um, you know, his, his student heard that term, but he's using it in a different way. And, and I look at early Mormonism and... Look, I'm not a Mormon. I don't believe in Mormonism. So from my perspective, I accept the critical approach that says Joseph Smith just pretty much made it all up. Um, and if Joseph Smith made it all up and he's saying about the first vision, it was, it was the Lord and then it's the father and the son. And those are very different things. Um, I think they are. Um, and then, in, and then in the book of Mormon, he's anti-Masonic, but later he joins the Masons. I mean, this is textbook stuff that you would say, well, no, that was written by Joseph Smith. If, if you were coming from uh, New Testament studies or Old Testament studies, Joseph Smith wrote that, but Oliver Cowdery uh, must have written that or some other guy, right? Who knows? Uh, because they have different approaches to uh, Freemasonry or they have different approaches to, um, uh, uh, you know, what the first vision was. Or a great example is something I wrote to you in, in messages before this interview, um, which to me is an incredible example is uh is this idea of 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 what happens when you die right so in the book of mormon there's eternal damnation eternal punishment and then in the doctrine and covenants he he tell us about that one cuz that's incredible that's that's you would have to say in medieval studies or old testament new testament studies that there's two different authors but we know there's not two different authors or at least we think so right so so tell us about that about about the eternal damnation and how that or punishment in the Book of Mormon versus in the Doctrine and Covenants or Book of Commandments. Right. Well, Joseph Smith, uh, he um, 
had to deal with what a lot of early charismatic groups end up having to deal with is non-fulfillment of prophecy. (laughs) Recovering from mistakes, recovering, trying to, um, you know, change or spin certain things. I, I liken it to just, just about like if you study psychics, you know, mm-hmm. psychics who foretell the future, who, uh, re- you know, read people's fortunes and things. Uh, they, they, they don't, they're not always right. And they don't always expect themselves to be right either. But um, neither did Joseph Smith. And plus, um, mm-hmm. You start right away, right away with the failure of certain things. Uh, he would give out what God's decrees are unalterable. You know that would be one of the mm-hmm. statements. And then he would give a decree, right. and and this decree uh, said so and so will go with so and so on a mission. You know, and it would give a list of you know. And and in the beginning, his his revelations had to do with minute, you know, details of everyday life almost, you know, like, you know, administrative things. Every little administrative decision is a revelation, you know, because that's what they bragged about being different than everybody else. Uh, we have revelation and they don't. You know, that's why they don't have authority. They don't have revelation. Well, so... When he signed so and so to go with so and so on a mission, and then that person apostatized before the mission, well, didn't God know that? You know, mm. so he would say he would try to get out of those things by uh, uh, saying that uh, that God can alter, you know, what he says. Uh, Joseph Smith himself would say, well, God would say, do this, do this, but then certain things would change, and then he, God would change you know, what he would do. So he would try to spin it that way. And a lot of his early followers noticed that and quit, <laughs> you know. like So this is not unique in the history of religion. So, no. uh, you know, in Islam, famously, uh, Muhammad, uh, the original revelation was that they should pray in the direction of Jerusalem. Mm-hmm. And then at some point, Allah changed his mind. Or, and here I want to be careful because I'm not an expert in early Islam. But basically, there was a new revelation that says, "No, the Qibla is now is now towards Mecca," and and they have no. And, and this actually is a major focus of early Islamic um, or Islamic um, jurisprudence and study is what are the earlier parts of the Quran because it's not in chronological order. And what are the latest parts because they have what's called the doctrine of abrogation. Allah absolutely gives new revelations, and only the latest revelation is what's binding today. So if in one verse he says, cut the throats of the unbelievers or something, and I'm, I'm sure I'm misquoting that, I apologize. And another one he says, you know, don't, there's no compulsion in matters of religion. It's fundamental which is later and which is earlier because that determines what you do in the 21st century. And there are huge debates about this in Islam, if I understand correctly. So you're saying there's a similar thing in, in, in uh, Joseph Smith's career where his revelations would... God would change his mind, basically, and, and maybe in your terminology, would you say that? What, how would he describe it? Okay, so he had different ways of getting out of these problems yeah. and uh, or recovering from failure. Mm-hmm. So another example would be the main revelation or reason for Joseph Smith, his mission was to establish a new Jerusalem in America, a mm. Zion in Je- Independence Jackson County, Missouri. Mm -hmm. And that never happened. Well, originally it wasn't even in in Missouri. Wasn't it across the Mississippi River in Indian Territory? Am I wrong about that? Originally it was in Indian Territory, but as the uh, missionaries went there to find a spot, they were kicked out of the Indian Territory. And so Mm -hmm. uh, Joseph Smith had to even, even come to Missouri to find the place. I mean, why didn't he just look in his stone or whatever and find it right. when he over there in Ohio? No, Joseph Smith had to come all the way to Missouri and f- look around, and then he gets a revelation. Oh, it's by the courthouse in Independence, Missouri, and that's where it it was established within the territory, uh, United States territory at the time. Mm-hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And yeah, it was supposed to be among the Lamanites. And which are the what we would call the Native Americans or in my generation they called them the American Indians. Yeah. Yeah. The the, the American Indians, uh now Native Americans, uh they were in the Book of Mormon, Lamanites. There were Nephites and Lamanites, and the Lamanites destroyed the uh Nephites. And uh, then the Lamanites became the uh, Native Americans. So, mm-hmm. and they believed the more early Mormons, just part of Joseph Smith's mission was to convert the Native Americans who were Israelites and fulfill Old Testament prophecy by converting, and New Testament, converting them to Jesus and uh, causing them to repent and learning their true heritage. And that was all part of the latter days. The signs of the latter days was the restoration of Israel, which this was his version of it. And uh, so that didn't happen. They got kicked out of Missouri. They got persecuted and kicked out of Missouri. And they were never able to fulfill that revelation. And it caused a lot of anxiety uh, about unfulfilled revelation. So how do you handle that? And what Joe Smith gets another revelation when he's in Illinois that says it was a commandment to build the temple in this New Jerusalem, but you were hindered. And but when you go to do everything you can to uh, fulfill God's uh, uh, commandments, and you can't, God accepts the offering, and so it was, it was kind of revoked. Hmm the commandment to build the temple in this generation was revoked because they had been obedient in trying to do it, but were hindered from doing it. So God more or less uh, excused them from the commandment. It's still a prophecy. The prophecy is still in effect, but the commandment to build it in this generation has been uh, suspended. So okay, was there something where they said, well, um, no, he says, so he's saying accept the offering. Um, so he's not saying, well, you didn't get to do this because you were sinners, which would be like an Old Testament sort of explanation. Um, uh, you're saying it's because, okay, some outside force hindered them. And so you did the best you could basically is. Yeah, okay. that, was, that was part of it. But at the time, at the time when you get really down into the weeds of it all, You'll find out that Joseph Smith at first had no explanation for why they couldn't uh, establish Zion in, mm-hmm. and how they got kicked out of the Holy Land. So, so early Mormons, they lost their Holy Land, similar to the Israelites losing their Holy Land. And how do you, how do you explain this loss? God said David's supposed to sit on the throne forever and ever, and that didn't happen. What, how do you explain that? And so they have their own crisis that they worked out with prophets. But... Uh, then you have just as the early Mormons did the same thing, but in a lot compressed, <laughs> compressed amount of time. So this is an important, uh, and we're going to gloss over this. I apologize to the LDS folks listening. There was one of the most shameful events in, um, from my perspective, in American history, where the early Mormons settled Missouri, and they were violently dispossessed of the land that they legally purchased. And, and the response of the governor was to issue an order of, it was called the order of extermination, right? Yeah. I mean, I, I and you've, ex- I've heard you explain this while they were terrified, the people there. Okay. That doesn't justify, uh, well, I don't, I, I don't think that justifies violently dispossessing people of their land. Um, you could say the people in Cicero, Illinois, who violently drove out, um, African Americans, uh, were terrified, and and I believe they were leg- were uh, were actually not legitimately because they were it wasn't legitimate, but they were actually terrified of African Americans. So they violently drove them out of Cicero, Illinois, in the fifties. They tore one house apart brick by brick, or something like that. My dad told me that uh, I grew up in Chicago, and he told me that happened in the fifties. Um, you know, so so violently dispossessing the Mormons of their land, even if they had concerns, well, they should have used the law. Um, in my perspective, but, but this is something that happened in U S history that I was never taught, right? This is one of the, yeah. I think one, one of the great injustices of U S history. What, tell, tell us about that. So Let's the, talk about that. Cause that's so, so the, the, uh, 
from what you've heard, it seems like these Missourians just out of nowhere started persecuting these Mormons and cast them out of, you know, called out an extermination order, the governor Boggs did, and kicked them out of their state. And it doesn't make any sense. No, I, I, I'm saying I, I acknowledge. Well, you, you tell us what no, happened. That's, let's let's that's do it that way. That's the story that you usually hear, but there's. Okay, more. that's you're saying that's what the average. Well, let's be honest. Most there's of my audience has never heard of it. So there's more to it. If you, what if I so what, you the Mormons were the yeah. first ones to call out an extermination order against the Missourians? Okay, I didn't know that. that. Changed okay. some things. I didn't know that. <laughs> tell us more okay. about that. So, um. The, the Mormons, uh, they were, before the, they were, they were kicked out of Jackson County, Missouri. And it was mostly because of the people living there were slaveholders. And okay. they perceived the Mormon uh, immigrants as non-slaveholders. And the Mormons that moved there were zealous extremist religionists they weren't just uh, believers in some kind of different doctrine they they their their beliefs included this world you know like uh building they're coming into your community where you've uh, raised your family and you have a, a lot of investment and they're coming in and they're saying god has given us this land you might as well leave Mm-hmm. And you can't stop the predictions. God's pr- predicted that we will own all of this land, so you might as well sell it to us, you know, now. And they, and then they have this book, the Book of Mormon, that predicts that these Indians across the line, just across the line, mm-hmm. are going to raise up and destroy the Gentiles. And Gentile well, in this context means the non-Mormons. Which means the non-Mormons. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and those who don't convert will be destroyed. And mm-hmm. so these, the Mormons scared the non Mormons. They were frightened. Now, the Mormons were trying to get them out, trying to get them to sell, trying to, you know, all sorts of things and spouting the, getting up in their, in their sermons talking about all this, this prediction in the, in the, the Book of Mormon about what the Indians or the Native Americans will do, and uh, in conjunction with uh, the the uh, believing Gentiles and converted Native Americans will join in into an army and cleanse America, basically. Mm-hmm. Uh, but until then, they will build a new Jerusalem and it will be a place of refuge. Well. America's going through a lot of tribulations and wars and things. Um, so that you're predicting all of that. And then uh, um, these, these um, uh, what, what tipped the, po- the tipping point was when And they were publishing a newspaper right there in Independence. It was the only newspaper, and it was Mormon. And um, in there, uh, W.W. Phelps, the guy who was the editor of that, published an article called Free People of Color. And more or less, he was talking about uh, migrating converted Black Mormons into Missouri, and they would be free. And although Missourians have slaves, Mm -hmm. and they knew that the mixture, bringing free blacks in with the enslaved blacks would cause a lot of social uh, commotion and problems and uh, rebellion. And Mm -hmm. the United States had just gone through uh, some slave rebellions of its own. Mm slave rebellions, and they were afraid of that as well, okay? And they saw the Mormons as stirring up this possibility of of being uh, uh, wiped out by the Native Americans or the blacks rising up because they see all these free blacks being 
you know, running around their community all of a sudden. Well, the point, the thing is, is that there were no, there, there were no black Mormons to come into their, that area. It was all what I interpret as a way of making them want to leave, you know, Mm -hmm. this would, this would be bringing free blacks into their community. One motivation perhaps for them to believe, to leave, but this strategy backfired on them and they went the missourians went and destroyed their press and kicked the mormons out of there and out of that county and they were welcomed into clay county the neighboring county and they went there for a time before they went to their own county that where they were supposed to stay in their own county caldwell county and they didn't stay within that county they started spreading into other counties and then the the Missourians had enough and they started organizing vigilante uh, community, you know, vigilante militia. Mm -hmm. And um, the, but the Mormons, Sidney Rigdon, the guy that was like next in line, Joseph Smith, more or less Mm -hmm. got up. He was a big public speaker type orator mm-hmm. and got up and and said we're not going to put up with this persecution anymore we, if you persecute us we will take this battle to you and it would be a, a bloody war of extermination and he okay. was the first one to use that term i guess that was a that was a bad choice of words on his part in <laughs> retrospect but so, uh that doesn't justify uh, ethnically cleansing or or religiously cleansing um because not ethnic uh, religiously cleansing Missouri of of its Mormons, um, which is what happened. But but I, I guess I guess we're arguing. I mean, look to I look at this as like you know if you were a if you were um, a, a Catholic in 14th century Germany and you saw people dying left and right from the Black Plague, and your uh, your uh, not pastor, what do you call it? Your priest in your church was telling you it's because the Jews are poisoning the well. So I understand why they wiped out the Jews in, in all these different cities all over Germany in the 1340s, because they genuinely believe the Jews, Jews are poisoning the well. And on top of that, you have Jews who have prophecies that say, well, one day our Messiah is going to come and we'll rule the wor- world, right? Now that's kind of hypothetical and more like, you well, know, no, no Jew thinks that's going to ha- actually happen. We pray it might, but it's not going to probably yeah. happen in our lifetime. And, and so I, I want to draw an analogy there to... I understand you're saying there's a difference that there were all kinds of social upheavals and the Mormons were maybe more this worldly as far as the fulfillment of prophecy, whereas for Jews, it's some hypothetical thing in the future. Mm. But from the perspective of the Catholics, what they think is, well, yeah, the Jews are going to, are going to bring in the antichrist and he'll try to take over the world and and they're in league with Satan and we got, we better kill him now before they kill us. Right. I mean, it's hard for me not to see an analogy between the persecution of the Mormons, even though they might not have handled things things right in in Missouri and and the um and the uh persecution of Jews in the Middle Ages. Uh okay, well, and obviously there's a million differences, but there seems to me to be an analogy there. It wasn't abstract, just abstract. The Mormons actually formed their own army of Israel mm-hmm. and armed yeah, with like 500 guys and very few guns. I mean, they armed right. they armed themselves and they went to the neighboring county of Dav- Davies and they actually burnt three cities. And then they had a, a skirmish in the s- southern Davies County, uh, yeah. or Caldwell County, excuse me, uh, called uh, 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 the Battle of Crooked R- River. And it was that several people on both sides got killed. They actually attacked a state militia. Okay. Mm-hmm. They attacked the state militia. Mm hmm. Uh, then they went around burning people's houses, you know, and so it was uh, in, an insurrection, more or less, that had to be put down. And they didn't just put it down. They decided to solve the whole thing. They arrested the, Joseph Smith and several other leaders and put them in Liberty Jail and held them for six months. What, what year is all this taking place or what span of years? Oh, 1838. But it, but the 1839. So the first settlements of Missouri were in what year, or the first expedition to Missouri by the Mormons? What year was that? 1831. 
18, so 1831, they arrive there trying to convert the what they call the Lamanites. They get kicked out of Indian territory. They end up in, in Missouri Jackson, itself. In Jackson County. 1831, they choose the location. This is just a fatal mistake was to choose an exact location by revelation that he mm-hmm. could hang on to and uh, that where people had already lived. Mm-hmm. You know, it would have been better if he chose some place where no one else was living. But... He didn't. He chose this spot, and he did it by revelation, which was a mistake. This is his the, the fatal mistake of his career right here. And so, uh, by 1833, July 1833, they're being kicked out of Jackson County, and they go to Clay County. Mm-hmm. Um, then they settle Caldwell County. Joe Smith makes a uh, uh, few trips. There are only about two, maybe three later. By 1838, Ohio, Kirtland, Ohio is uh, not uh, conducive to staying in for Joseph Smith. So he moves permanently in 1838 to Missouri to um, uh, escape creditors. So they started out in upstate New York. They end up having their headquarters in a place called Kirtland, Ohio. And then their headquarters becomes Missouri. It eventually becomes Southwestern Illinois, Nauvoo, where he's uh, eventually is murdered there yeah. or in that area. Right? Yeah. Carthage. So, so um, I, I want to draw an analogy here and I, I'm not an historian. I'm a philologist, right? So I oh, okay. use history to understand ancient texts. I think you use texts to understand history. So it's a bit, we're kind of opposite of what we do. Um, so uh, in around roughly the same time, because you called an insurrection, that's really interesting. Roughly around the same time, within a few decades, mm-hmm. in China, you have something called the Taiping Rebel- Rebellion. And it's founded by this person who has a revelation, just like Joseph Smith, except in his revelation, he finds out he's the brother of Jesus. He rebels against the Qing emperor, and he establishes what is essentially an empire in central southern China that lasts for over 10 years. And so he does what I think you suspect Joseph Smith wanted to do, is he creates a religious empire. Yeah. Um, and it takes foreign powers from Europe to defeat him. The Qing can't defeat him. They bring in Chinese Gordon, uh, who is a general who had, uh, was eventually killed at Khartoum. Uh, there's an international force, uh, General Cho from General Cho's Chicken, who is from Changsha, or a suburb of Changsha, where I lived for a year. Um, he was the Chinese general who who led the Chinese forces, but by himself they couldn't defeat the the, the Taiping. Uh, um, it was called the Heavenly Kingdom. Um, that could have happened in the United States. We could have had, uh, and I think you you I've heard you say I think correct if I'm wrong that that was one of his objectives was to create a theocracy in uh, the western part of the United States in the Mississippi Valley. And that actually, that could have happened if history had gone slightly differently. So talk yeah. about that. That's, that's like, that's unbelievable. Like, like we don't like today. I, I don't know. Here's my impression of Mormons as a non-Mormon. Uh, like we even make jokes, right? We make jokes that at the airport when they're, you know, frisking the, uh, the Muslim in the, um, in the hijab, you know, like, well, they're not doing that to Mormons, right? Cause the Mormons are these, these like, these docile, friendly people. That's not your experience because you grew up Mormon, right? And you know the history. But I think that's the impression of the average American is, you know, we have no security concerns for Mormons. But history could have gone way different. I want you to talk about that for a little bit. Well, there, there is a, a, a militant strain in Mormonism. It's in the Book mm-hmm. of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is a revolutionary document. It, mm. it is... It predicts the founding of a, th- of a theocracy, the New mm-hmm. Jerusalem, what I call the New Jerusalem government, yeah. uh, in the wilderness of America. But this wasn't a foreign idea. I mean, you had um, the Burr conspiracy, a- Aaron Burr. The famous, so the tell us what the Burr conspiracy is. Uh, Alexander Hamilton in a duel. Right. Well, okay. He was trying to. St- Start a Western coup, what they call a Western coup, a government in, independent of the United States, you know. Really? Yeah, uh, it never came to fruition. 
And all right, we we, we got to stop here for a second. Who's Aaron Burr and what was the Burr conspiracy? <laughs> got it. You can't just gloss over that. <laughs> okay, so so this is around. Uh, he was running for president and failed at that attempt, but it, it's a Jefferson's uh, revolution of uh, 1800, you know, uh, that Aaron Burr uh, was trying to formulate a coup a, in a Western uh, empire in the you know, uh, uncharted territories in the United States, basically. And the um, in the early days, it was believed that, uh, or accused, Andrew Jackson was accused of uh, conspiring with Aaron Burr, but really, I'm not so sure about that. But And at this point, Western means what? Across the Appalachian Mountains, or where's Western at this point? Yeah, okay. Uh, in, in Indian Territory, past the Mississippi, Mississippi, Oh, okay. Before Across the, Indi- the Mississippi. Before the okay. Indians were driven there. Okay. So this is before the Trail of Tears and the... Yeah. But there's still Indians in, in, uh, or American Native Americans across the Mississippi, just not oh, yeah. the tribes that later were expelled to there. Okay. So, well, so it across short, the Mississippi... It was a short-lived kind of uh, adventure, <laughs> you might call mm-hmm. it, uh, that totally failed. It didn't go anywhere. They had like... They used... Uh, uh, the the um, Royal Arch cipher, it is said, to write messages dealing with this conspiracy to uh, establish a government uh, in in America, uh, United States territory, mm-hmm. territorial areas. But okay, so there's precedent for uh, um, a rival uh, government government uh in the west oh, that's yeah i didn't know about that okay so joseph smith though uh according to the book of mormon and prophecies these are prophecies that he was trying to fulfill mm-hmm. uh was going to establish a new jerusalem government uh with native americans that would be mostly their their government with the aid of believing Gentiles and you know non uh, Israelites put it that way. So believing Indian Gentiles is another Israelites. So believing that, Gentiles is another way of saying um, white Mormons. Is that yeah. okay? So so uh, all right. So I, I so I think this brings us back to a bigger question, which is why did Joseph Smith write the Book of Mormon? Uh, that's and, why. That's why a lot of people okay. don't know that nowadays. They all okay. see that as prophecy in the future. It's a very nebulous idea. You know, when Jesus comes again, maybe when the world is changed. Anyway, mm-hmm. they don't realize that Joseph Smith was trying to do it. <laughs> you know, so you, so you believe he wrote one of the reasons he wrote the Book of Mormon was in order to lay the foundation for this theocracy in the western part of what. At the time, was the U.S. Well, he had no, he had no location. Oh, okay, he no somewhere location. he wanted. This would be the, this would give him authority to rule this theocracy. Basically, is is your contention? Yes. Okay. To be so the, that, the prophet of this theocracy that would have a perfect community, they would be one uh, in love and heart. You know, their hearts would be knit together, and they will. Um, have this perfect utopian society mm-hmm. well, not unlike quakers shakers you know the, the oneida commune is another secular kind of experiment in in communalism you know mm-hmm. and so joseph smith the book of mormon it was all about communalism it was all about the ideal of that acts passage where it talks about the the early christians had all things in common you know, that's really interesting because the Taiping rebels focused on those verses as well in Acts. Yeah. And then later Mao uh, uh, sort of retconned the um, uh, Taiping rebellion as an early workers revolt and as a proto form of communism. Right. Because actually, was, I think it was before Marx, uh, or at least before his publication of the Communist Manifesto, um, the, at least the initial Taiping. I could be wrong about that. 
Uh, but the initial heavenly kingdom, I think, might have, it certainly didn't, even if Marx had written his works at that point, they wouldn't have been aware of it in, you know, South Central China at that point. Um, but they also had, they experimented in some form of communal um, pooling of property, um, which early Mormons did as well. Mm-hmm. Um, which, and I find that that was really surprising. Like this was, um, I mean, this is what, some of the things that got them in trouble was, was experimenting with, um, you know, dis- redistribution of wealth. Mm-hmm. Um, and it failed essentially, uh, from an economic perspective, right? That was the whole bank in, in Ohio that failed because they're, they're trying to print money and, and then give it to people and they have no way to back it up. And, um, yeah, the, the, the bank was a different kind of thing but it failed but before just smith even arrived in um northern ohio in the geauga county uh there were already christians believe, uh practicing a form of communalism with, mm-hmm. with uh they were kind of um a group associated with alexander campbell's uh church of christ um or disciples of Christ, they they were called the family, morally family, and uh, Joe Smith tried to correct or change uh, the way they did things in this communal group. But it was essentially uh, he established a bishop, the Bishop Edward Partridge, who w- was a former Camelite, and and Sidney Rigdon, who was also a former Camelite. Who had been a bishop in in the uh, Campbellite group, but the bishop just meant leader of a congregation to them. Here, Joe Smith changed bishop to uh, have authority over uh, worldly affairs, you know, like um, economic and you know land and things like that. And the the plan was to that when you join this and you gave all everything up to Jesus, and the, which is the you gave the bishop all your property, and then he decided what you needed and gave it that portion back. And he would save wow. the other portion for the poor. Mm-hmm. So that was the that was the uh, plan to begin with. So do you think this has something to do with Joseph Smith growing up in like abject poverty? That he has this um, ideal, well, you know, nobody should have to have that poverty. We should. You know, some people have too much, and so we should we should share it with the people who don't have. Is is do you think that has anything to do with it? Yeah, it had it has to do somewhat with that. That they here are the he thought these uh, religious people that didn't share enough with the poor were hypocrites, basically. And um, if you're he said if you're not equal in wealth, you're not equal you know, in the kingdom of God, kind of in heaven. So hmm. uh, he, uh, he demanded, it's a high demand religion from the start, you know, yeah. giving, giving up your all. And eventually it doesn't work and they replace it with tithing a 10% of your. So you're saying the Mormons today are getting off easy with 10% compared to what it was in the early days. No, it's a, it's harder now. Uh, oh, how, how used, so? It used in the beginning the ten percent was just a, of your increase of your okay. of your interest for that year, not not on everything of the interest. Okay, you know, um, so it wasn't like a ten percent of your gross income, you know. Yeah, but it, but in the Kirtland days, it was a hundred percent, and then you get back what the Mormon what the oh. bishop thinks you need. Well, yeah, so, it's a lesser law. It was the lesser law. Well, now, I don't know what that means, the lesser law. Was. Lesser law, meaning easier. It was the easier law. The tithing, tithing is an, it was an Old Testament practice. For and, sure, right. And that, that was a lot easier than the law of consecration. The okay. law of consecration was where, where you consecrate everything. Right, so compared to the, the Kirtland days, they're getting off easy is the point. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and even the Missouri days. I, I well, okay. There's a lot where go. I want to go back to why he wrote the Book of Mormon, okay? Because um, now we have almost a contradiction in what you're saying, uh, and I'm sure you can explain it. Um, but I'm I'm trying to like my mind's all over the place. So you've <laughs> talked about how 
Um, so the doctrines and covenant, let's talk about that for a few minutes. What is that? And what was it originally? Well, um, so, so Joseph Smith, he was dictating his revelations through that same stone to begin with. And, uh, and we're going to go back because we didn't really talk about the stone and the magic. <laughs> I, I want to spend some time talking about that, but we'll hopefully do that later. Write a note or something. Uh, yeah, I have notes here. Yeah. Now, so he was dictating revelations beginning with that mm -hmm. trans translation crisis. So that opened mm -hmm. up a whole thing. And uh, people would come to him. Oh, what do we do in this case? What do we do in that case? You know, and he would get a revelation and answer that question or this question. What does it mean in this passage of scripture? And he would get a revelation and he would give an interpretation of that passage of scripture directly from God. And um, so the, they started accumulating these revelations. And, and one of the important ones was called the law, you know, the law. What do you and mean? The law? Law? It, there was a publication called the law. Well, it was a, it was a two parter, but now it's combined okay. into one, and it's now D Doctrine and Covenants section forty two. Okay, it was originally called the law. Wow, the okay. law, which was it gave, okay. what do you do in this circumstance? That circumstance? What is adultery? What is fornication? What is you know murder? What it you know it goes through. By the way, we've been law. speaking for over two hours, and we haven't spoken about polygamy. We probably won't even get to that, but but uh, that's what probably people are waiting for. When's he going to talk about polygamy? That, to me, is the least interesting part of this whole thing. Um, well, it, to me. It's all but wrapped okay. up to all together. It's all intertwined. That's why it's so hard to unravel. Okay. Uh, so he's getting these revelations, and then mm -hmm. he wants to publish them. Mm -hmm. And some people uh, resist publishing the revelations. Uh, they, they're not so sure uh, that they should. And, and mostly because... Um, they know it, it's a different quality than the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon struck, you know, the stone, and it's a translation of prophets. But is Joseph Smith a prophet? Mm. <laughs> right? And so that's actually a question in the early days. Yeah, is he on the same wow. level? He's a translator, right? Wow. Remember that wow. one revelation? Uh, one of the early revelations given in March of 1829 uh, says that he should pretend to no other gift than to translate the Book of Mormon. I, I want to open that up and show that to the audience, but I want to first understand what are all these revelations, right? So yeah. that that is that I think that's really fascinating. That that um, okay, so so they're writing these things down as he's as he's revealing them. How mm -hmm. do they get published? Like, are they originally published in the newspaper or something? Or no, so periodical? they're going to publish it in a book form. And mm. um, they, they, they are publishing some of them in the newspaper. The Mormon periodical called The Evening and the Morning Star published in Independence, Missouri. Wow. Wow. In 1831. Okay. Well, and, you know, they're trying to fulfill the word of the Lord shall come out of Zion. You know, out of okay. Ah, and Zion, the, the new of, Zion is um, yeah, is, is Independence, Missouri. Okay. Yeah. Wow. So okay. That's what they're trying to do, and so they published wow. this, this, these, some of these revelations, and now they decide they need a rule to judge people by. They're 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 having problems with people not obeying the commandments, not uh, listening to the revelations, and uh, so. They need to have a rule, a way of judging people, and they need to publish this so that, that there's an expectation on everybody to this is what is expected, you know. And some balk at that. They don't. They're not so sure that that should be done. They resist, uh, but Joe Smith overcomes it by challenging them to produce a revelation equal to the least what they consider the least of these revelations. Wow! If you can't do it. You got to endorse it. Oh, yeah. We have to stop there for a second. <laughs> um, so in Joseph Smith's lifetime, there were people who tried to uh, disparage him by comparing him to Mohammed. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. I want to make a comparison to Mohammed, but not to disparage him, just as two phenomena of, of history. Yeah. Um, the Quran itself has a doctrine called inimitability, which I'm sure I'm mispronouncing which is this idea that you you are not capable of producing a single surah 
uh, you know, in Islam, the miracle of Islam, you know, they say Jesus and Moses, you know, perform miracles, you know, healing and Jesus and Moses splitting the sea. The miracle of Muhammad is the Quran itself. And the proof of it, that it's a miracle is you can't produce even a single chapter of the Quran. And, and that's in the Quran itself. It's the doctrine yeah. of inimitability. Yeah. I'm um, aware of that. And, and so they have this idea that, uh, in, in, that it's the greatest of all poetry ever written. Uh, I'm not a judge of poetry, so I don't know. Um, and, and of course, the, the, um, the uh, response to that by non-Muslims is to say, well, I can't produce a single sonnet of Shakespeare either, because Shakespeare wrote those, right? Um, I can't write a single play of Shakespeare. It doesn't mean Shakespeare had revelations from God. But it, it's incredible to me that, it, that early Mormonism, and Mormonism maybe even today, has the same doctrine. Yeah. Let's see you produce uh, a, a single a revelation the way that Joseph Smith has. Um, and, then I, and then here's the other analogy to Muhammad. So in, in uh, Islam, there's this doctrine that Muhammad was illiterate. Um, and therefore, you can't say he was imitating something he read somewhere because he actually couldn't even read and he had no education. So how did he write such amazing poetry? That's part of the miracle. And it's almost verbatim in some cases, I'm exaggerating, not verbatim, but it's uncanny the parallels where they describe Joseph Smith, I think rightfully so, as uneducated and crass, and his wife, uh, or is his wife or his mother says he couldn't even, uh, I think it's his wife after he dies, says he, he couldn't even dictate a letter. How could he have dictated the Book of Mormon? He couldn't even dictate a personal letter. Uh, am I right about that? Is, is yeah. there something there where, okay. Do you so, say that? So, so talk to me about these parallels. And I know you're not an expert in Islam, but am I wrong? Is there something here like in the parallels as different phenomena and completely different history, periods of history? And I can't believe for a second that somebody in Joseph Smith's time was sitting down and reading Islamic theology and saying, hey, we should, we should steal that one, right? We, sh we should claim an imitability. No, but they're, I think they're two independent growths outgrowths of different situations. Uh, that's my view. What, 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 talk to me about that. Yeah, how do you respond to the challenge? And why are they they're challenging him? Because they, they listen to him every day. They know the revelations sound like him. You know, right. somewhat. You know, but in a biblical, imitation biblical style. Would uh, you say and, that the, the revelations style. he had... Sorry, go ahead. So, so they knew they knew what he sounded like, and they knew that the revelations, even though there's some moments where it they're very, uh, um, you know, the language is very uh, eloquent. Mm -hmm. You could still hear Joseph's voice. So that's okay. the question. Do the prophets speak in God, just dictate God's words? Or do does God use them to speak through and their per different personalities show up? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, they saw the, the weakness. And what the rev one revelation, the revelation, uh, one of his revelations says that God speaks to man in his own weakness through what does that mean through his own understanding so it's saying these revelations are saying that um god is speaking through joseph smith not joe smith dictating god's words that he like perceives or hears and he's just repeating them so it's not literal joe smith is right away so I've always contended that Joseph Smith put out to the people that he's just dictating God's words or that he's dictating the words on the stone. Privately, he has a different definition of revelation that is more liberal, more uh, nuanced than what he let out. That is less faith promoting, <laughs> you know, mm. so. Um, when he challenges his followers to imitate God's words, he knows they're not going to be able to do that. Even if they, they all can write better than him. They're all, you know, the people challenging him are, are more learned than he is and can use language 
written languages. Particularly Sidney Rigdon is truly a talented yes. orator, right? And, and writer. Yeah, in the style that people would expect in the 19th century. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we'd probably be all rolling our eyes. In contrast to Joseph Smith, who famously in the Book of Mormon, instead of in those days, he, he's dictating in them days. Yeah. Um, right? So that's clearly his, uh, and I shouldn't say clearly because uh, um, uh, Royal Skousen might disagree with me. But to me, it's clear that this is um, him uh, expressing things in the level of, in the dialect of English that he knows. Mm -hmm. um, and... Uh, it, it, I mean, I guess you can make a bunch of arguments about it, but it seems to me that's the case, and it seems to so, I think most people that's the case, right? I mean, yeah. most non Mormons. So I, I would argue that it, when he's in the spirit, yeah, he probably feels that he dictates better than he normally can talk, mm -hmm. and he gets into a mode of speech that uh, he doesn't like write in his letters. You know, writing a letter that Emma mentions is totally different than speaking. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Joseph Smith is very good at language, spoken language. Even in the Book of Mormon, the writers in the Book of Mormon complain that they're not good writers, that they're better. If they were there in person speaking, you would feel the spirit. It, it would be much better. Mm. Uh, Interesting. So he's letting his own, you know, weakness show. Uh, but he's a charismatic leader. He 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 already has confidence that he can get people to do what he needs to be done, and he knows that he can speak. He knows he can't write that well, right? So, so he's having these he, he's having these revelations. They're collecting them, and then when do they first? And they're initially publishing them in the um, in the in the uh, periodical, the newspaper. But then they have something called the Book of Commandments, right? Okay, so just to finish the, my earlier thought before yeah, please. we move on, is that yeah. he knows that these guys are not going to pretend to speak in God's voice. Uh, it's too frightening for them to even attempt it. Okay. Okay. He knows he, they're not going to do it. Okay. And he... He has confidence that he can dictate things like the Book of Mormon, like his revelations, uh, and uh, pseudepigraphical writing. He can imitate pseudepigraphical writing, writing written by uh, pretending to be a prophet. Uh, right. He can do that. He is he has confidence that's why he's doing it and he's not the only one there's there's lots of people in his environment writing revelations there's there's mormons that later go on like Sidney rigdon himself to dictate revelations there's a 16 year old boy in kirtland ohio that dictates a whole book that sounds a lot like isaiah wrote it <laughs> you know so so you say on the one hand he knows like it, it here's what it sounds to me like you're saying he knows he's willing to pretend to be God's voice, but he knows they're not willing to do that. No, that he, he in my in my interpretation, he believes he is inspired. Oh, okay. So he's he is so inspired, he, okay. but it's coming through him. He knows it's this, coming through him. So this is what you call the pious fraud. Yeah. Um, and I wanna I hope we can talk about that. That was the initial thing that got me interested in in wanting to talk to you. I was <laughs> yeah. fascinated so by that. So he's not he, to me in my view, he believes he is a prophet. Okay. But not the kind he projects to everybody else to, to promote their faith in his revelations. Yeah. And that's the trick he learned as a money digger, how to build confidence mm -hmm. in other people, how to get other people to believe what he's seeing in his stone. Anybody can go up and say, I see whatever, right? In a, I am looking at this crystal ball and I see this and that. How do you get other people to believe that you are? And that's the talent that he developed before he became the Mormon prophet. So we're going to circle back to Money Digger. I hope we'll have time and energy because uh, that's a fascinating thing in and of itself. We kind of alluded to it in an earlier section where you talked about they were visionary and they were not, um, they were untraditional. And if we don't get to it, guys, 
go to Dan Vogel's um, YouTube page. He has long videos about um, about the seer stone and folk magic and all that. And and um, I, I think that's one of the most interesting things about the whole story. Uh, all of it's interesting. But we're talking about these um, revelations he's having. He knows they're not going to imitate him. But there are people who are doing it. Like Hiram Page has a seer stone, and, and they're writing down what he says. And Joseph Smith goes ballistic. Yeah, well, that's one uh, of the problems with charismatic uh, uh, religions, is that charisma is can, it spreads to everybody. I mean, you're attracting people, so they'll have charismatic experiences, but then they start getting revelations that compete with yours. And there's a chance that the whole thing could splinter into a thousand pieces, you know, with different groups going off here and there, liking that person's revelation or that person's over yours. And and to to hold it together, mm -hmm. okay, is the trick. Is that Joe Smith is trying to negotiate from day one. I mean, Hiram Page is like right there in the first year. So tell us about Hiram Page. Pretend the audience never heard of him. Tell us what happens there. That's incredible to me. Well, Hiram Page uh, was a brother-in-law to, uh, had married one of the Whitmer's, David Whitmer's sisters. Mm -hmm. And he's right there where the Book of Mormon is being translated. And in fact, some of the Whitmer's are some of the scribes who are transcribing yeah. Joseph Smith's words. So these aren't just some random people. They're at the epicenter of the revelation of the Book of Mormon. Yeah, sometimes they, they give Oliver Cowdery a rest. And yeah. John Whitmer... His handwriting is yeah. has been found in the original dictated manuscript of the part that you know the whatever forty percent less than 40 I think it's twenty eight percent survives according 28, to Rosenhausen. Okay. Twenty eight percent. That sounds right. Yes, uh, that has survived. Yeah, and uh, so we know that that part was done at that time during the month of June. I, I want I want to, I want to point out something here which is blows my mind. Right. Yeah. So. So I think some people who first become acquainted with the story of Joseph Smith will say, well, the whole thing's made up, right? He didn't sit there uh, uh, dictating a book to people, but we actually have the manuscript in which they copied down his words, and it's very clear it was a dictation. Yes, and it's, uh, oral. it's oral, and there's mistakes right. in it that are not visual. Right, exactly. Mistakes. That's incredible. That we would have 28% uh, or maybe it's a little bit more now uh, with multispectral imaging of the of, of being able to read twenty eight percent of the original manuscript. Yeah, that that is like I wish we had twenty eight percent of the original copy. I wish we had one percent of the original copy of the Book of Jeremiah, yeah. which were by the way is described as the same thing. They said to Baruch the son of Neriah, "How did how was this written?" He said, "Jeremiah would speak and I would write." Right, so we have an interesting parallel there. Um, so uh, uh, yeah. Jeremiah wasn't looking into a hat, presumably, but that's a whole separate story. <laughs> um, it, it's a dictation. So, all right. So, so Hiram Page, Hiram he's at the Page. epicenter. Yeah, he. Uh, well, they're they're not so sure Joseph Smith is the one and only prophet, the leader. <laughs> There's no such thing yet. He's just a translator. So, uh, and he's gotten some revelations, but aren't we all supposed to get revelations, you know? That's and didn't did. Joseph Smith him say that, himself say that, that everyone's supposed to have the Holy Spirit or something? Or was there something like that? Oh, yeah. You see, it's supposed to be a restoration of the, of the spiritual gifts, tongues, prophecy. They, they, in their meetings, they stand up and prophesy, you know, or... Or uh, speak in tongues mm -hmm. and see visions. They're a charismatic, very charismatic group. A little, not so much like the Mormons are today. <laughs> you know, they've all, it's all been institutionalized. And that's part of what my next book that's coming out in a few months. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, What's the book called? Do we have a, 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 it's a Joseph, preview? It's, it's the middle years. It's the Joseph Smith. Uh, uh, charisma under pressure. Wow. Okay. Charisma under pressure. So, and okay. it take, and it's it's working off of uh, Max Weber's, um, you know, from charisma to institution. 
is mm -hmm. one of his studies. He's a sociologist at the turn uh, from the 19th to the 20th century. And uh, he wrote about how charismatic groups, and it's not only religious charismatic groups, it's any kind of group that has a leader that's based on personality and, you know, the draw of the personality, you know, kind of a thing. It could be a business even, you know, but all, okay. all groups, these charismatic groups have this instability built into it, you know, and it tries to seek this homeostasis, you know, equilibrium. And how does it do that? And also be dealing with the problem of, of unfulfilled prophecy, you know, how do you overcome that? And you know, like the early Christians. And it eventually becomes institutionalized, where charisma doesn't rest in the personality of the leader. It rests in the office. Mm. Anybody inherits the office, has that charisma of the office, you know, and it has this tendency to uh, balance itself. So um, Joseph Smith, one of his genius, his genius parts is uh, he was able to build an institution mm -hmm. that was, you know, self-preserving. And mm. by, the time, by the time the unfulfilled prophecy came around, the institution was strong enough to survive it. Mm. That's it in the nutshell. That's yeah. really interesting. So, so charisma, and by charisma, what, I, what you mean here, I think, and what I definitely mean, is that they believed that they were actually having these spiritual revelations, experiences. You know, I, I, I wondered, well, before I studied this, why would anybody believe something as outlandish as uh, the Book of Mormon? And the answer from speaking to Mormons is, well, I prayed about it, and it was revealed to me that it's true. Mm -hmm. And why don't you pray about it, Nehemia, and see if... if if God or Jesus or whatever um, gives you a testimony to, that it's true. So that's a charismatic experience. Yes. Right. And so, uh, so the very thing that makes Mormons such devout believers and certainly in the early days is a danger because now you have competing voices. Maybe the spirit doesn't just tell me that the book of Mormon is true Maybe it tells me that, hey, it's not supposed to be Independence, Missouri. It's supposed to be Nauvoo, Illinois, or some, or you know, Utah, or someplace like that, right? So, um, so that brings us to Hiram Page. So Hiram Page is in the home of the Whitmers, and what happens? Well, he starts getting revelations. The, the uh, people want to know where is this Zion? Is it here? And in, in oh, so that exact thing. Is it here in Fayette? You know, are we in the Holy Land? Is this part of the Promised Land right here? And Hiram Page starts getting these revelations through a stone. Um, and he gets a ream of them, basic, you know, choir, they call it a ream, you know, a lot. Uh, so, so people are writing down what he says. He's not just yeah, getting revelations. Yeah, okay. just like Joseph Smith. And, wow. uh, and he locates Zion, it appears from the descriptions anyway, that it, right there. And, and so Joseph Smith gets a counter revelation accusing uh, or labeling uh, Hiram Page's revelations as satanic. And wow. uh, these are false revelations and uh, they're not to follow these. And um, it has not been revealed where Zion shall be, you know, at this point. It was, that's what it declared. Nobody knew where yeah. Zion was. Okay. So, um, and it would be shortly. So I interpret that as a, they had this anxiety, this need to for the mysteries. They wanted the mysteries solved. They wanted somebody to get revelations about these things. And Joseph Smith wasn't delivering fast enough. And this is, was his cue. This was his cue to hmm. step it up a little bit, you know? So, so, uh, so this is important. This is real. This, I think this is, one of the pivotal events in the history of the early church, uh -huh. because it's not just, okay, uh, um, Hiram Page is having Satan reveal stuff to him or whatever the terminology is, but, they, but then they have a 
an outcome from this. Tell us about that, where they establish there's only one person who's allowed to be a revelator, right? I mean, is that yeah. something that comes out of this? Yeah, yeah. So they they take Hiram Page's stone and they grind it up according to tradition. They ground wow. it up and destroyed it and destroyed his revelations. And, and Hiram Page isn't resisting this. He he accepts no, this, right? And he was having uh, a lot of influence on the Whitmers and Oliver Cowdery. Mm-hmm. So they're all not clear on, well, what what is going on here? Is Joseph Smith, we're supposed to follow Joseph Smith and Joseph Smith only? Well, Joseph Smith gets a revelation more or less saying, yes, this. if it, there's to be any revelations giving, it, given, there's a, it will be given through Joseph Smith. Wow. That, that's convenient. Uh <laughs> That's what they do. They call it the revelation of convenience. Yeah. So well, who calls it that? The the it's just, it's just a term that they throw around. Oh, okay. Not to... not the Mormons though, right? They would say it's a true revelation, right? Yeah. Or I'm asking. Right. Okay. Look and and so so the result of this is not only does this silence um Hiram Page, it prevents anybody else from challenging his authority, right? Not exactly. <laughs> oh, okay. So not exactly. It's so uh another uh let's say challenger came mm-hmm. about in when he moved to Ohio the next year mm-hmm. uh a woman named, uh, we know as Hubble okay this woman started getting revelations and they had to get another revelation about mm-hmm. it and saying that basically the same thing that uh only Joseph Smith is to get revelations for the church mm-hmm. Okay. D- does Hiram Page accept Joseph Smith's revelation and say, yeah. okay, I was wrong, it was Satan? Mm-hmm. Do we know if Hubble accepted it? Um, not, not much is known about her. Okay. Just her name and the story. And well, uh, some people, some scholars think they know her identity, but we, mm-hmm. she, I don't think she uh, had, had a long, his, very long history with Joseph Smith or the church. Okay. Um, Isn't there something where David Whitner, Whitmer, um, like at some point in the beginning, Joseph Smith is looking into a hat at a stone and there's a revel, he, he's claiming there's revelation coming to him through the stone, right? Mm-hmm. And, and at some point he stops using the stone. And, and, and I, I read somewhere or heard somewhere that David Whitmer becomes convinced, I think, that that's where Joseph Smith won off the path because he stopped using the stone. It, tell us about that. Yeah. So, um, true. Yeah. So he's using the stone. He's getting revelations through the stone. And at what point he gives the stone up and starts just using revelation inspiration through, you know, through his mind uh, is uncertain, but it's early. He gives the stone to Oliver Cowdery. Mm-hmm. Oliver Cowdery is his family had it after he died in 1850, gave gave it to Brigham Young's brother, Phineas Young, who took it to uh, Utah, and we got the picture of it. So we have the stone to this day, right? It's, it's the stone that and, they they published a picture of. You can see right, it on the internet. And, and to be clear, the church, the LDS Church in Utah, they're the ones who published the photo, and they say this is the stone. Yeah, that Joseph Smith used to reveal the Book of Mormon, right? Yeah, and it has a little leather bag, which okay. is probably an amulet bag. Oh, interesting. And, so, the, and, so this but, isn't Dan Vogel, the ex bitter Mormon, who's <laughs> trying to badmouth Joseph Smith and saying that he used the stone. The LDS Church itself says that, right? That's right. Wow. They have Does, now. They used to way back before we had any sources and things, and it was just David Whitmer mm-hmm. talking about this stone that he saw Joseph Smith using. Uh, there was a time when everybody knew it during the 19th century. Then there was a time when nobody seemed to know about it. And it was old David Whitmer. He's uh, he's an anti-Mormon. He was a non-Mormon at the time he's saying this. He's just trying to hurt Joseph Smith. Actually, he's trying to help <laughs> Joseph Smith. Uh, he believes in the stone, so he wouldn't make up the stone to hurt Joseph Smith if he's trying to say Joseph Smith made a mistake by giving the stone up. You know what I'm saying? So, right, for sure. So, so um, and that's what where a lot of real conservative apologists on the internet, the internet's kind of a good thing and kind of a bad thing. You know, you have to be careful. 
Ain't that the truth? <laughs> it's a place where you learn. The, uh, smart people learn faster, and where dumb people learn faster, also. But uh-huh. <laughs> misinformation is spread if people that are not very critical, yeah, and uh, or just not or casual learners uh, pick up the wrong information. It's a good thing and, and it's a bad thing. So be careful out there, everybody. <laughs> well, there's this one apologist. I saw a video where this apologist says, well, who are you going to believe? David Whitmer talking about a stone or Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, who yeah. uh, the, the, the prophet who revealed the Book of Mormon and the scribe who, who transcribed certainly most of it. Um, who are you going to believe? Uh, them? Uh, uh, Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery, who say it was the, the spectacles? Or... Um, or David Whitmer, who became uh, an apostate, who uh, who ended up leaving the church, right? Yeah. So okay, that's not for me to decide, uh, but Albert you know, and Joseph Smith, in their in their official accounts, mm-hmm. talked about Urim and Thummim, or the interpreters, you know, or Joseph Smith used the term spectacles in 1832, and mm-hmm. uh, they that was the official line. And the reason why was because they were downplaying the magical folk magic origins of early Mormonism. They were mm. for the mainstream and trying to convert people. And this is the official accounts. Now, you should be wary of any official account, not just Mormons. <laughs> well, but if, you're, if, if you believe that Joseph Smith is a prophet, and Joseph Smith says this is how it happened, and... You know, you talked about the curtain, whether there was a curtain or not. I guess that's a matter of debate, or maybe sometimes there was a curtain. Um, uh, who? I mean, I, I understand their perspective, right? If if you have this burning feeling in your heart, and literally they talk about a burning feeling, I think, um, that says this is true, and Joseph Smith is a true prophet, and Joseph Smith writes that it was, you know, these spectacles. I understand why they believe what they believe, mm-hmm. uh, but what you're looking at is is all of the evidence. Um, from different sources, some of them are anti-Mormon and some of them are pro-Mormon, right? Like, um, like David Whitmer is a believer until the day he dies, right? They just yeah. made a movie about it. The the more the LDS, I think, made a movie about how although he left the church, he to the day he died, um, he's testifying the Book of Mormon is true, and he really saw it. That has to do with the witnesses. Uh, did you see that movie that that came out recently? No. You know what I'm talking about, though. Yes. The, Okay. I think it's called The Witnesses or The Witness yeah. or something like that. Uh-huh. It was a good movie. Uh, well, I don't know if it was a good movie. I, I found it entertaining. I don't know if it was correct or not. Um, so, um, okay. So, Hiram well, Page has these revelations. Yeah. This woman has other revelations. At the end of the day, the conclusion is there's only one prophet who's allowed to, to have revelations for people to follow in practice, right? Meaning... Isn't there some idea that you can have a revelation, but you can't be teaching that this is what you should do, right? Something like that. Yeah, you can have personal revelation, but you can't give uh, the revelation that Joseph Smith dictated said, Joseph, Oliver Cowdery could have revelations, uh, but not, but he could not write them. Mm. <laughs> you're not, okay. you have revelations, but you are not to write them, you know, because he knows that it gets codified in the book. And the oh, wow. becomes the law, and yeah. that's the one reason why he wants them published is that so these revelations answer and keep the people from straying too far away from Justice Smith's central authority. There's other there's other problems that crop up, and he's constantly doing maintenance on his primary sole position. He's like the translator of the Book of Mormon. Then he becomes one of the high priests then he becomes the president of the high priest then he becomes the president of the church so it develops wow. his his control of the organization develops over time and there's there's there are people resisting all the way david whitmer being one of them you know uh resisting his sole uh command of the church so the on the stone thing, we have uh, 
So Albert Cowdery and Joseph Smith are, are the only ones saying, talking about this Urim and Thummim and translating with the Urim and Thummim. And, um, because it's the party line, they're uh, trying to move the church away from the folk magic origins. Anyway, thanks so much for all your time. Uh, thanks for having we, me. We, we, uh, I, I hope we are able to broadcast all of this. We've been recording at this mm -hmm. point, guys. I think this is a personal record for me. We've been recording for, I, I want to say, um, almost like seven and a half hours or something like that. So thanks so much. All right. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's McCore Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at NehemiasWall.com.